Welcome to your lecture on sleep, dreams, and body rhythm. This unit is about altered states of consciousness, so it's only natural to start with the question, what is consciousness? Well, your consciousness is your awareness of yourself, your internal thoughts and feelings, and also your external environment. Sometimes it's just simply or simplified down to your wakeful state. Our biological rhythms fall into three major categories infraradian, ultradian, and circadian rhythms. The reason that we talk about this is because we do talk about how our biology affects our states of consciousness. Here we're looking at a 24-hour cycle. Now this is a 24-hour cycle for an adult brain. There's a couple of things that will shift. So let's start in the evening. At about 2100 hours, 9 p.m., melatonin secretion starts in an adult brain. So in my brain, at about 9 p.m., I'm going to start to feel naturally drowsy. For teens, this gets pushed two hours later. So biologically, naturally, you're going to feel drowsy closer to 11 p.m. That also means that when it comes to melatonin secretion stopping, for me, that's going to be around 7.30 in the morning. And that'll give me a nice long sleep period. And we'll talk about why sleep is so absolutely necessary. Unfortunately for you guys, during a normal school year, we're asking you to wake up probably closer to 5.30 or 6 a.m. And we're going very much against this natural biological rhythm. For you guys, you're more likely to be healthier if you sleep until about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Then we start looking at everything else that happens. Best coordination, fastest reaction time, cardiovascular uh, efficiency and muscle strength. All of these things are set to a biological rhythm. Areas where we function our best or maybe when things need to turn on and turn off. Your circadian rhythm is going to be the biological rhythm that rules your 24-hour clock. And that's essentially, you're awake during the day and you sleep at night, that would be one cycle. Your ultraradian rhythm, however, is a biological rhythm that occurs more than once in each day. And if we actually dissected your maybe eight hours of sleep, during that entire eight hour chunk of sleep, you probably had several REM cycles and that meant that you went through several non-REM cycles. Well, the fact that you go in and out of these cycles while you're sleeping is an ultra-radian rhythm. Intra-radian rhythms happen more infrequently, maybe once a season and for ladies once a month, getting your period would be an infra-radian rhythm. All of these rhythms, whether they are 24 hours, multiple times a day, or seasonal, or once a month, they occur without our conscious effort. Our body does this on its own, and we're often unaware of these rhythms, while others we are fairly aware of. The circadian rhythm, or the circadian clock, maintains that 24-hour sleep-wake cycle, and this is actually dictated by a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is located in the hypothalamus. This structure is a really tiny structure, a pair of pinhead sized regions that contain about 10,000 neurons, really tiny but heavily packed with neurons. Biology and the modern world don't always sync up together. The human circadian rhythm is a little bit over 24 hours. It's actually closer to 24 and a half hours, maybe even 25 hours. We've trained ourselves or reset ourselves to our environment, the photo period day and night cycle, which is 24 hours. So we are slightly shorting ourselves by about a half an hour on our normal biological clock. Retinal ganglion cells are photoreceptive. So these are these cells that we had talked about really earlier on when we were talking about vision. And they send signals directly to that suprachiasmatic nucleus. So if you've ever been asleep at like the beach where it gets really, really sunny, well, you know some light waves can penetrate through your closed eyelids. When they hit those ganglion cells, that sends a message right to that suprachiasmatic nucleus, and those light signals help regulate our sleep-wake cycles, which is why it's easier for us to wake with a light source, and why you might wake up at the beach a lot earlier than you want to. Without light cues, our sleep would follow roughly a 24 and a half to 25 hour schedule, shifting a little each day because of that extra half an hour or so. Everyone everywhere hates Mondays, and there's actually a reason for this. We call it the Monday morning blues, and it's really simply explained this way. Often on the weekends, we explain to ourselves that we have more time to sleep in. We can catch a nap in the middle of the day and, and we don't have to be as alert or wakeful as we normally would be. So we'll stay up late and we'll sleep in an hour or two. 
Well, that staying up late and sleeping an hour or more in actually adjusts our clock. And so when the alarm rings at 6.30 in the morning, our body feels like it's 4.30. And it's because we have shifted our clock, which makes it harder to get up on those days that we have to return to our regularly scheduled kind of programming. We used to think that sleep was just a period of inactivity, a period where we would just kind of power down so we wouldn't get eaten by lions and tigers and bears. But the reality is that all animals sleep. And when we look at how some other animals sleep, like dolphins, we realize that there has to be a reason for this behavior. It can't just be a basic survival mechanism. If a dolphin were to sleep with their full brain, go out like humans do, they would drown. They can only stay submerged for roughly about 10 minutes before they need air. However, what a dolphin will do is put their right hemisphere to sleep while their left hemisphere stays active, and then flip it, let their left hemisphere sleep while their right hemisphere is active. What this tells researchers is that maybe there's some more important reason for why we sleep other than just to power down. Welcome to two words that define your generation, sleep deprivation or sleep deprived. So why should you care whether or not you are lacking sleep? Well, there's some pretty important health consequences that come with just missing out on a couple of hours of sleep each night. First off, it decreases the hormone levels that are necessary for proper immune system functioning. People who are sleep deprived get sick more often and they can get pretty serious illnesses a lot easier than other people. Increased levels in your uh, stress hormone called cortisol. Well, cortisol is great when you're in fight or flight, but when you're not, it can actually start messing with your heart and it can be the hormone that kind of gums up your arteries. So definitely not good to have in your system all the time. Can contribute to hypertension, impaired concentration. Think about the days that you come to school exhausted and you just can't seem to track. Irritability, no one's surprised that a tired person is cranky. Suppression of cancer fighting immune cells. How horrible is that? That by being sleep deprived, you increase the chance of something like cancer becoming a greater issue because the immune cells that should fight it aren't able to work. And then premature aging. It also increases other things like fatal accidents, more than that of alcohol related fatal accidents. Sleep debt is the amount of time that you owe yourself back when you are sleep deprived. As a teenager, you need nine or more hours nightly to be fully awake during the day. Let me say that again, nine plus. No, you are not special. You don't need only five hours or only six hours or only seven hours. Biologically, as an organism, you need nine hours or more to be at your optimal functioning. So what happens when you're not getting this? Well, eventually your body is gonna require that you pay back the time that you owe it, which may explain why you sleep in on the weekends or that you crash and nap after school. It does not appear that we're able to adapt to getting less sleep than our bodies require. Now that isn't to say that some people can't function more appropriately closer to maybe the eight hour range and some students maybe closer to the 10 hour range, but none of you are going to function efficiently and at your best with five hours of sleep. You can try to make it up with caffeine and other stimulants, trying to avoid feeling sleepy, but that doesn't counteract all the other effects of the sleep deprivation. Yes, you might be consciously alert, but you may still have the lags in cognition and problem solving. You might still very easily get sick. You might still be incredibly irritable and highly stressed out, all leading to major health consequences. What happens when you stay up 24 hours, 48 hours? Or in the case of someone like Randy Gardner, he stayed up for 11 days for a high school science fair. He was monitored by a doctor and a sleep specialist, and the legend has that he was completely fine in the end. Ultimately, that is slightly true. Uh, after getting a ridiculous amount of catch-up sleep, he did go back to normal. But while he was going through the 11 days of no sleep, he definitely had some pretty strong effects. By day two, he couldn't focus his eyes. He had to give up watching television for the next 11 days. So we have things called rotary drift where you can't keep your eyes straight. They kind of trail off to the side and just have difficulty focusing. So if you've ever been in class about to fall asleep and you've kind of felt your vision start to go, Randy was having that. By day three, he was incredibly moody. 
his physical strength and coordination had begun to deteriorate. By day four, he began to hallucinate, and you guys just saw a picture of Randy, and he mistook a street sign for a person, and he believed himself to be a black professional football player, and when told by others that he was not, he accused them all of being racist. By day eight, Randy's speech had become slow and slurred, showing some definite cognitive deficits. By day nine, his thinking was fragmented and he couldn't finish his thoughts or his sentences. By day 11, after a full neurological exam, he seemed to have some normal coordination and some adequate balance, but still had that rotary drift in his eyes, his speech was slurred, and he had little if any attention span. He then slept for 14 hours and 40 minutes, was up for about a day, and then went back to sleep for another 10 and a half hours. Physical and psychological problems that he had, well, they disappeared after he started getting regular sleep again. And it is worth noting that most normal adults can't and shouldn't go without sleep for more than 60 hours. There's lots of misconceptions about sleep, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're just now really finding a way to effectively study it. Again, remember brain scans in the 1990s. Sleep is a time for the body in general and the brain specifically just to shut down and hit snooze. Well, that's misconception number one. Sleep is actually very active, and in fact, during your sleep, your brain is as active as if it were fully awake. There's no evidence that any major organ or regulatory system in the body shuts down at all during sleep. Some brain activity, including delta waves, increase dramatically during sleep, and the endocrine system increases secretion of certain hormones during sleep. The body and the brain become active. Getting just one hour less of sleep each night, well, that's really not going to bother you. Well, if you think about people who have jet lag and they've only maybe crossed one time zone, that can be pretty disorienting. And you guys do this to yourselves all the time. You just chop off an hour here or an hour there. When daily sleep time is less than what you need, you start to accumulate the debt. And your body doesn't care that you had to stay up to work on a homework assignment or you had to stay up because you had a late traveling football game or you had to stay up because you were dealing with a friend and their issue. It doesn't matter. Your body is still going to accumulate that and feel drowsy and feel tired and deal with the consequences of lacking that sleep. It accumulates. Misconception number three, the body just quickly to different sleep schedules. So it doesn't matter if you work on night shift or evening shift or you have some kind of weird flex shift, you know, your body will just get used to it. Wrong. Your body is set for the circadian rhythm. Be awake during light cycles and be asleep during the dark. And unfortunately, when you mess with that, you start to mess with your health. Those who work night shifts naturally feel sleepy when nighttime occurs. And so they're likely to use different things like coffee or something else just to keep them alert and feeling awake. Having worked midnights, it is really, really hard. And sometimes you just feel kind of out of touch with reality when it's dark out and it feels like it's supposed to be your lunchtime and then you're going to sleep when the sun rises and you actually feel a little energized just by seeing the sun. That kind of normal shift work can be really damaging to a person. Misconception number four, people need less sleep as they get older. Well, that's not really true. Yes, you need less sleep than when you were an infant and you were sleeping anywhere from 16 to 18 hours a day. And yes, as an adult, you need less sleep than you did when you were a teen when you needed around nine to 10 hours. But ultimately, that amount of sleep needed kind of levels off in adulthood. The problem is, is that adults might actually get woken more often and have harder times getting a full night's sleep in one chunk. So seeing your grandparents nap or fall asleep somewhere, that might be them making up that time that they didn't get at night. They might be more easily disturbed by a light or a noise than when they were younger. And some of them will have medical conditions that can contribute to other sleep problems. So here you see again, while there is a slight decline, uh, we're looking at anywhere from 31 to 90 years. Well, they're not really changing that drastically. They stay roughly within about the same time. You guys have all heard this misconception. A good night's sleep will cure being drowsy during the day. Well, it depends on the quality of the sleep. So sleep disorders to include sleep apnea, insomnia, narcolepsy, well, you might be asleep, but you may not be getting quality sleep. And when it comes to sleep, quality and quantity are important. 
we've talked briefly about some of the benefits of sleep, but let's just kind of review this. So your hypothalamus is the control center for that 24 hour circadian rhythm, specifically that suprachiasmatic nucleus. That area of the brain is gonna control your endocrine system and it will tell it to increase or decrease hormones. Melatonin being the important one for feeling drowsy. Melatonin decreases with light and increases in the dark, beginning or kind of starting our feelings of sleepiness. Here's your hypothalamus. We sleep for two possible reasons, preservation and restoration. Preservation, well, we're diurnal or daytime animals. And so by being asleep at night, it prevents us from being out in the wild where we maybe weren't going to be as effective in the dark. Remember, we don't see well in the dark and we're not necessarily incredibly agile. So being out stumbling around would have been a good time for a predator to pick us off. Restoration on the other hand, well, sleep has a lot of restorative qualities and it might be really important in keeping our brain active and flexible, rebuilding things, uh, consolidating memories, reorganizing information that was learned the previous day. This is a fantastic documentary on the real risks of sleeplessness in America, whether we're talking about shift work or we're talking about high school students. They actually go and interview students in Fairfax County and they look at the real risks of sleep deprivation in teens, how it affects academic scores and driving behavior. And in all honesty, they make a incredibly compelling argument for why school start times should be closer to 8.30 or 9 o'clock for teens. I agree with it fully. If you ever have a chance to watch it, please do. Sleep is broken down into two major categories, non-REM and REM. Non-REM is going to be your non-rapid eye movement sleep. During your sleep cycle, you have a 90-minute ultraradian cycle. That's going to be repeated several times. And to figure out where you are in that sleep cycle, we'll use what's called an EEG, an electroencephalograph. Attach electrodes to different parts of the brain and measure the eye movements, muscle tension, and brain waves to see what's being active at that time. Here you have someone's eight hour sleep cycle. And what you're seeing is roughly about five full cycles that are happening within this one sleep period. So again, here we're looking at multiple cycles that would happen in a single night. And you see that there's the red lines called REM. Well, REM is your rapid eye movement. That's your dream state. Everything in blue, that's non -REM. Your first stage of sleep is stage one, and that's really what it's called. And this is a non-REM stage. It lasts about five minutes. You're easily woken from this. Sometimes you feel like you've just kind of drifted off and that you're not actually fully asleep. If you've ever fallen asleep in class, you've felt this because usually within the first couple of minutes, you're like, oh, my eyes are still closed. Why are my eyes closed? I should open my eyes. I think I'm sleeping. Oh, I want to wake up. If you're doing that, you're probably in stage one. Stage two. Well, stage two of non-REM is characterized by something called sleep spindles. These like bursts of uh, very tight brainwave activity. It lasts about 20 minutes and you're actually going to go back into stage two several times throughout a night. So here you're seeing alpha or relaxed alpha waves. Stage one, you start to see the waves change. And stage two, that tight little blue burst, you're seeing a spindle of activity. Obviously, the next stage we're going to go into is three and then four. Well, three and four get paired together and they last for about 30 minutes. So five minutes in one, 20 minutes in two, and about 30 minutes now here in stage three and four. And this is called Delta sleep. This is hugely, hugely important. This is the non-REM restorative sleep that you need. Large, slow Delta waves, less than one cycle per second. And this is where we think that we actually strengthen academic knowledge, that any of the information, any of the storylines that are important for you to remember from the day will actually get strengthened here. So study before you sleep. It's actually really good because it will be fresh in your brain and you may actually strengthen the synapses during stage three and four sleep. This is also the stage where a lot of sleep disorders occur. So sleep disorders don't normally occur during your dream states. They usually occur during your non-REM states. So here again, you have stage three into stage four. So naturally following this, you feel like you should then go into REM sleep. And that's not how it works. You go stage one, two, three, four, and then you have to climb up the ladder. 
three, two, one. And before you go back into alpha waves, these bright awake kind of waves, you go into REM sleep, which is your dream state. So like I was telling you guys, you go up the ladder, down the ladder, up the ladder, down the ladder. You go one, two, three, four, three, two, one, and then you go into REM, which is your rapid eye movement or your dream state. During your dreaming, you're going to have vivid dreams. So your brain is incredibly active. This is a really good time for procedural memories to become further entrenched. Your to-do, like if you're trying to get better at hitting a baseball, well, that's when that's gonna become a much stronger behavior. If you're very concerned about performing a, a solo for a band concert, well, you're gonna get better during this stage. But the interesting thing is that during REM sleep, we call it a paradox because it's kind of contrary to itself. Your body is completely inactive and your brain is completely 100% turned on and active as if you were awake. So you have a fully awake mind and a fully unconscious body. The other nice thing is your pons is active, keeping your body paralyzed. It's stopping all of those motor messages right at the spinal column. So your body is relaxed, even though it feels like it's moving and it's completely active. And you're gonna alternate between stage two and REM sleep for the last four hours of your night's sleep. Do not get tricked by things that sound too good to be true. You cannot learn while you're sleeping. That doesn't mean you can't improve how you learn through sleep. So knowing this, I always have my son do his flashcards one last time before he turns lights out. There's a reason for that. Going through that information one more time actually causes his brain to work on it during the non-REM cycles. Have an athlete visualize gameplay and what they should do during their game right before they go to sleep. Well, you're gonna find out that that's gonna help strengthen itself during their REM stage. So I had mentioned that REM is paradoxical or a paradox. And here's just a quick rundown of why. First off, your brain is awake. Second, during that rapid eye movement, your eyes are actually darting back and forth beneath your eyelids. Your pulse quickens, your breathing also becomes much faster and irregular. Your body is temporarily paralyzed as the pons blocks the message from your motor cortex to the rest of your body. And during a dream state, people are almost impossible to wake up. People who say they woke up during a dream usually came out of the REM sleep and into stage one sleep and then woke up. Dreaming occurs during your REM sleep and it is in color and it is in sound and it is in images and it's in emotions. All of those things happen during REM sleep. But here's the cool thing. If you don't have access to one of those senses, you don't dream in color or in sound or in. So someone who is blind doesn't have the visual part of their dreams unless they've ever had vision. Um, but a different way of looking at that is um, one of my students who got color correction glasses for her color blindness is starting to dream in color because the brain is being rewired for color. So whatever information you feed your brain can come into your dreams. And your dreaming takes up about a quarter of your nightly sleep if you are getting your full night's sleep. Infants will spend the most amount of time in REM sleep, which is strange because it's not like they have a whole lot of lived experiences. So maybe your dream states have far more to do with your ability to get your body ready to function than it has to do with you telling yourselves a meaningful story about, I don't know, a goose that ate a toad on a roadmap to Mars. Why do we dream? Well, we're going to look at a couple of very quick different theories, but let's start with Freud since I don't like Freud. Freud, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, said that dreams are the key to understanding our inner conflicts. In fact, he called it the royal road to the unconscious. Well, here's the deal. You are usually fairly aware of what's going on with yourself because you're you. Very few things are hidden from you since you are, again, you. So he said that our dreams had things like manifest content and manifest content was the storyline. So let's say the other night I had a dream and I've had this dream before that I woke up late for my final and I was in college and this was going to be the thing that was really important for me graduating. And then he said, there's latent content. 
the unconscious content of the story. What's going on behind all of this? And he would have started to pick apart what all the symbols in my story meant, blah, 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 blah. Well, I always have this kind of dream when I'm stressed out. And it's just a manifestation of stress. And since I'm used to that storyline with my stress, it just kind of happens to be a revolving story. He said this expresses wish fulfillment. So should we guess that I want to go back to college? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm good where I'm at. Should we guess that this has some deeper rooted meaning in some, I, it doesn't. It's just a weird dream that I have. Most dreams can be traced back through analysis to erratic wishes. Nope. No, that's just wrong. That's 100% wrong. That's not right. It's just wrong. That's where Freud was really wrong. So if you weren't sure how I felt about this, Freud's wrong. This is not a currently accepted theory. I should probably put that underlined and in bold because people love to go to their dream journals and try to figure out what they're trying to tell themselves. Be honest with yourself and you don't have to spend the money on a dream journal. Dreams don't actually possess symbolic meaning. They don't have hidden messages or storylines. Uh, this myth is actually a reading assignment that we would normally have in class if we were meeting in person. So why else might we dream? Well, one is actually called information processing. Rapid eye movement, REM sleep, your dream state, it helps with memory storage, especially when we're talking about physical memories and also especially during stressful times. So it helps you kind of sift through the everyday garbage and figure out what's important. And sometimes it actually helps you problem solve. Why else do we dream? Well, physiological functioning. It provides periodic stimulation for the brain. Infants need more time in REM sleep than adults do, and they're growing like crazy. And the pituitary gland is gonna secrete growth hormone. Another is activation synthesis theory. Now, it's important to note that not just one of these theories is correct. Sometimes there's multiple reasons for why we do something. And activation synthesis helps explain the really whacked out crazy dreams that we have at times. Dreams are the mind's attempt to make sense out of the sleeping brain. We have this random neural activation as your body is going through this kind of systems check, causing different areas to spark. And your brain doesn't deal well with inconsistencies. So as these different areas are spontaneously firing, your brain puts it to a story. And the stories can just be really weird sometimes. Cognitive development theory is actually not so much a reason for why we dream, but maybe a better explanation for what we dream. This means that Dreaming is part of maturation. As you get older, your dreams become more developed. And basically it says that dreams reflect your knowledge. So you can only dream about something that you've thought about or experienced or had some exposure to. And then you can combine it in every kind of weird, screwy way that your brain wants to combine it. But it does explain why young kids have very simplified dreams and adults have much more complex dreams. There are some gender differences when it comes to dreaming and cultural differences. Krippner's research indicated that geography and culture affect dream and content. Looking at 400 middle class and upper class Argentinian, Brazilian, and American adults from 91 to 95, he found out that Americans tended to dream more about animals and food and Brazilians had more sexual and emotional dreams. Americans and Argentinians reported more dreams of ar architecture than Brazilians did, which might explain the building thing with me missing out on my final exam. Argentinians reported more dreams about aggression and good fortune. And there were even differences within our own country. People from the Northeast seemed to dream more about things like time and activity, streets and architecture, where the South, it was more about good fortune, emotion, family, and nature. And people out West, well, more about architecture, objects, negative emotions, and indoor settings. And maybe that's because they spend time inside very sprawling, spacious buildings. Other animals do experience REM, but we're not really certain if they dream like humans do. And that's just because we don't have a brain scan to really let us understand exactly what it is that they're experiencing. Without sufficient rest, you might actually have something called REM rebound, which is where you go to sleep and you immediately find yourself in a dream state. This is a huge indication of sleep deprivation. And some lower animals like fish don't have dream states. They're just more instinctual. That's what that typo should be, so sorry about that word. To keep this from being the world's longest video, we're gonna go through sleep disorders and sleep problems rather quickly. Some disorders can happen when people have a disruption in their circadian rhythm. Instead of being at 24 and a half, they may have a sleep cycle of 26 to 27 hours. The Klein-Levine syndrome, this one is sometimes known as sleeping beauty syndrome and there's nothing 
magical or fairy tale about it. During this time period, people will alternate between being completely asleep and being in kind of a sleep-like haze where they're not fully conscious. They will use the bathroom, they'll eat, they'll interact with people, but having no memory of having ever gotten up or woken up leaving their beds. This usually happens in adolescence and early adulthood with people having it for on average about 11 years. Now, during this time period when people are going through some of these states, they can miss really important events and they can never predict which night that they go to sleep is going to be the start of one of these periods or episodes. Hypnalgia is dream pain, so some people can feel pain while sleeping. And remember, pain is just created by the brain in the first place. It's your brain's interpretation of neural firing. So if the brain wants to feel pain when there is nothing to feel pain about, it can. Narcolepsy, falling asleep without realizing it. Now, people who are narcoleptic will actually usually have like a sensation of really intense drowsiness come on before they fall asleep. And it'll last anywhere from five minutes, but can last as long as 20 minutes, and there is no cure. You can get a driver's license if you're a narcoleptic because you can feel the attack coming on. Another disorder to be aware of is sleep apnea, and apnea means you stop breathing. The change from wakefulness to sleep causes the central nervous system in some people to not function properly. You can have central sleep apnea and the brain is no longer sending an impulse to the diaphragm to actually inhale and exhale. You can have upper airway sleep apnea where your breathing is blocked by the tongue or the throat and in some kids it can be um, their tonsils and their adenoids. After about 60 to 100 seconds of sleep the person usually wakes up because they have to wake up to breathe. Some people who have sleep apnea can wake up as many as 400 times in a single night meaning that they never really get past stage one sleep. The most common treatment is usually a mask, which will actually force oxygen into the lungs and keep the person breathing. Um, and for younger kids, if it has to do with tonsils and adenoids, well, that's usually just getting your tonsils and your adenoids removed. Another one is sleepwalking, and this is a stage four sleep disorder. It happens during delta wave sleep. It's also known as somnambulism. My son has decreased as he's gotten older, but has been a sleepwalker. And there was one evening he walked down, opened the garage door, sat up the house alarm, went all the way back up his room and crawled back into bed. When we went up to check on him, we were freaked out because we thought someone had broken into the house. Uh, I physically had to wake him up and I had to ask him if he went and opened the garage door and he had no memory of it, but it was in fact him. We'll talk about death by sleepwalker in class. We also have something called night terrors. Night terrors happen during delta wave sleep, so stage four sleep, usually in young children, very rarely in adults. And this is intense panic and fear. It is not a nightmare because it's not happening during REM sleep. So again, my poor son had some night terrors when he was little. Um, and you basically are just holding a child that is screaming in terror and crying and there's no nightmare, there's nothing, they're just, their body's reacting and it stinks. So both of these occur primarily in childhood, usually disappear by adolescence. They all happen during stage four sleep. So again, this has nothing to do with dreams. Neither sleepwalking nor night terrors are dream-based. Often, more often when a person is sleep deprived, it tends to run in families. So I don't remember having any of these episodes as a child. I don't know if my husband did, but our son does. So when he has kids later in life, maybe um, we can just remind him that if his kid sleepwalks, so did he. Insomnia is a reoccurring problem where falling asleep or staying asleep is the issue. Sleeping pills can increase feeling like you're asleep, but they prevent you from going actually into your sleep stages properly, and they can still just make you feel really, really sleepy during the daytime. It can be a result of anxiety, depression, stress, or just being overwhelmed. So I will tell you the day before school starts, I always have a hard time falling asleep. It's that same kind of really acute insomnia that I had when I was a kid when I thought Santa Claus was coming. When we talk about treating insomnia, sleep restriction, Sleep just the number of hours you need to. Make sure that you go to bed sleepy. Stimulus control. If you can't fall asleep within 20 minutes, then get out of bed and do something relaxing. In other words, your bed is only for sleeping. Kind of start to make a connection with that. Relax. Use something soothing, something like a visual image. Start to try to 
Get yourself into a meditative state where you are ready to go to sleep. Avoid consuming caffeinated beverages after 3 p.m., which for me is almost nearly impossible because I love my coffee. Don't nap. Try to get your body set on a very kind of strict clock. This is the time that I sleep. This is the time that I'm awake. Avoid nighttime activities that make you active. In other words, don't go to the gym at 9 o'clock at night. That's going to keep you up. Other sleep problems. Bruxism. This is when you hear people grinding their teeth and it is loud. They'll usually just wear a mouth guard. Myoclonosis, or what we call hypnic jerk. This is just hilarious to watch in class, um, but this is when the body has kind of just a sudden jerking motion to it, and that's usually happening during stage one or stage two sleep. And there have, and there always is stories about a student who has literally jerked themselves awake so hard that they've fallen out of a chair. Okay, so that wraps up for us all of the fun things that we need to know about sleep disorders. Um, this should give you guys a brief rundown on all of your biological rhythms, why we sleep, the different stages of sleep, and why we dream, and then the disorders associated with that state.